Welcome to Happy Hour Live, episode 8. Today is March, March, May 8th, uh, 2020. I'm losing track of time. In the crazy year of 2020, Murder Hornets, anybody, this week? Uh, happy phase 2 of the reopening of L.A. It is... Uh, I haven't read too much about it, but I know for sure flower shops are open, so Mother's Day is coming up in a couple days. Make sure you get flowers for your mom, your sister, anyone who you might think is or isn't or might be a mom, get them some flowers. Or just support your local florist. I know from first-hand experience, I never worked in one, but I have a very good friend who, whose parents ran a, fl a flower shop ever since I've known them, and it is a tough business. So support your local florist, buy some flowers, make your mom happy, make a mom happy, any mom, buy them some flowers. Uh, like a couple weeks ago, I mentioned a video that I was going to be in with Matt Howard, and I thought it was going to be released very soon. I thought Matt was releasing it, but it turned out that the LA Phil was releasing it. So, it took a while for him to do it, but it got released today. It is Bob Becker's States Medley, and Matt is playing the solo. He absolutely shreds on the xylophone. It is insane. I think you can actually, if you look close enough, you can watch the xylophone catch fire during some of his solo breaks. It is absolutely nuts. Such an honor to be a part of it. Check it out on all of LA Phil's social media pages on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you're going to be blown away by Matt's playing. Uh, he plays a solo, obviously. Then the other members of the section, Jim Baber and Perry Dryman, are playing Marimba 1 and 2. I am playing Marimba 3. Jeff Grant is playing Marimba 4. And Wesley Sumter, who is their resident percussion fellow, is playing drums. It is such a good video. Not only did Matt do the solo, he also edited it. So... Bravo to Matt. Kudos to you. Congratulations. It is an awesome, awesome video. Please check it out. Matt Howard. Brandon Chance. What's up, guys? Thank you for commenting. Nice haircut. Thanks, dude. I, I had to do it. I had to do it. For all of you, uh, I did a, not like a social distance haircut, but I had, I'm supporting local businesses. I'm supporting my barber who I've been going to for almost a decade now. I had him come to my house he gave me a haircut in my garage with the door open. He wore a mask and gloves. I wore a mask the whole time. It was great. We never, he never touched my face. We never shook hands. We didn't even exchange money. I paid him through Venmo. So, had to do it. My hair was getting insane. So, thank you, Matt. Looking fresh. Thanks, dude. Uh, my wife just posted Diana Morgan a link to something, but it's, it's a long link. So, anyway. Uh, on that topic, please, with this video, like, comment, and share. It is so important. Audience participation is so crucial to these discussions. Uh, it, it really helps move things along. It's really wonderful to hear from all of you. I love seeing new faces every week and new comments. It is so inspiring for me to keep this series going. So just remember to do that. Like, comment, share. At least comment. Just say hi. Wave, hand wave emoji, whatever. And at any time during this discussion, if you have a comment or a question, Please post it. We will get to it at some point in this interview. So, that being said. Oh, Diana posted the link to the LA Phil's page. Thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you for watching. So, auditions. They can be so, it can be so intimidating. It's like, you hear so many stories of, of an audition happening, and they get to the finals, they get the finals, and then the orchestra does a no hire. And then after that no, that no hire, they, they just invite people from other orchestras to do trials. They don't have to do the whole audition process. They don't have to prepare for an audition. They just show up, play with the orchestra, and then they hire someone from there, someone who already has a job. Or they pre-advance a bunch of people to finals, and they end up hiring one of those guys that they pre-advance who's already in a prominent orchestra with a full-time job. Or they have a private audition. All these scenarios, it makes it feel, it makes you insane. It's a catch-22. It's like, I, what, I have to have a job to win a job? Like, what, how do I do this? How do I make it in this, in this society? Or, or you show up to an audition, you're in a holding room, and you see people come in, you're like, oh man, that guy went to Tango, or that guy went to Music Academy, that guy's in New World, that guy was in New World, that guy has a job, this guy's in this orchestra, how am I going to compete with these people? It really is difficult to to grapple with mentally, and that is why I have my guest today. He was just in school in Boston, working around Boston, and then won the principal percussion job in Billings, Montana, for the Billings Symphony. It's a small regional orchestra. 
For those of you who are not musicians and don't know the difference between a regional orchestra and a professional orchestra or a full-time orchestra, regional orchestras, they have a much smaller season, typically six to seven concerts, and you just work one week out of the month. You're only paid per, per rehearsal and per concert, uh, and your, t your season is typically from October to May, one week, one week a month. So it's n nothing like the schedule of a full-time orchestra. So he has billings. And then shortly after that, I think a little over two years, he wins one of the biggest jobs in the world. And I'll tell you what he didn't do. He never went to Tanglewood. He never went to Music Academy. He was never a New World Fellow. He figured it out, and he went into that audition and beat all those people from those festivals and that training orchestra and people who had been pre-advanced to the finals. He went from the prelims to the semis to the finals, the only person to advance through all three rounds and then beat all the guys that they had invited to the final round. It is like a David and Goliath story. It is really inspiring. He is an avid runner, cyclist, weightlifter, a voracious reader of, of sci-fi and fantasy novels, but also books about neuroscience and epigenetics and quantum physics. Are you kidding me? He is loved by many, and he is the newly appointed assistant principal timpanist and section percussionist of the San Francisco Symphony. It is my pleasure to bring you Bryce Leafman. Bryce, welcome to the show. Eddie, how's it going? It's hey, going thank great. Thank you man. so much, man, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. No, oh, you're, you're welcome, man. It's uh, I was so happy when I heard that you won the job. We had only like messaged on Messenger like once or twice. We had met in Boston briefly when I was on tour with the LA Phil. We, you know, we didn't have any sort of pre-existing relationship. But when I heard that you had won, I, it was like this sense of relief. And I was like, thank you. Like someone who just you know worked their ass off and worked smart went through from the prelims to the semis to the finals and won a big job. It was such a relief because you, you don't hear that so much these days so congratulations number one that is amazing and so let's just share your story with everyone let's let's go let's take the road from Billings to San Francisco yeah well first of all thank you so much I, I really appreciate it it means a lot uh it's it's an awesome story and I'm very happy to be here to tell it to you and the audience and hopefully other people can be inspired and encouraged by my path like you mentioned and know that uh, there are a million different ways to cross the finish line in the orchestra world, and this applies not only to percussionists, obviously, but anyone who's on the orchestra audition circuit. Mm -hmm. So, like you mentioned, I won principal percussion in Billings in April of 2019, and I played one season as their principal, but the prelim for San Francisco was in November of 2019, so... Uh, just a few short months after that. So it was actually only 10 months between winning Billings and winning San Francisco. Pretty short time frame. Um, I took one audition in between that, which was the Montreal Symphony audition that was in May of 2019. And I was one of four finalists for that position. So uh, I feel like on my trajectory, Billings was, you know, kind of up in this direction, if we want to call this the top, you know, mm -hmm. um, I had been seeing some steady upward steps as far as making cuts and where I was going in auditions. And in April, I won Billings. In May, I made finals for a much bigger orchestra, Montreal Symphony, obviously. And then it was time to take on San Francisco in, in the fall. So um, before I kind of get into that whole story, I just kind of want to take a step back. And I think there are a number of things that helped me personally that I want to share with the audience today. Sure. Uh, things being uh, my mindset towards auditions and the, the way I conceived of auditions and the way I approached actually taking auditions and just things that I worked very hard to cultivate in my personality that I mm -hmm. think ended up playing out as huge assets in the long run on the audition circuit. Great. So... The, the three big ideas that I'm kind of hoping to tackle and, and maybe there'll be some offshoots are that artistry is a progression. That's a big thing for me. You know, I think when we're in undergrad and we're 18 years old and we just got to college and we have these amazing teachers from all these amazing orchestras or just amazing teachers in general uh, who are telling us all these vital things and huge pieces of information, you, you know, we 
are kind of feel like we're swimming. At least I did. You know, I remember being an undergrad and feeling like I had no idea what artistry was. I didn't know how to define artistry. Mm -hmm. And along the way, you know, I learned that you have to reinvent yourself multiple times, that this really is a progression. Um, and what that takes for me at least was consistency and dedication to practice. So I was always asking myself, you know, how can I improve as quickly and efficiently as possible? And I was always trying to improve upon my weaknesses. When I was a sophomore in Boston, I uh, took Matt McKay, who's a section <laughs> percussionist in the Boston Symphony, out yeah. to Starbucks, which is like two doors down from Symphony Hall and five doors down from NEC because they're catty corner to each other. Right. And I remember sitting at Starbucks with him and, and he gave me that advice. You know, I was, it was the very beginning of my sophomore year. He said, you know, you should never be in the practice room practicing the things you're good at. And when he was a student, he would sit in the hallway and hear what people were practicing and what they were working on. And that was a big thing for him to differentiate himself from the other people he was in school with. Developing his artistry was always trying to improve his weaknesses mm -hmm. and raise his floor while also increasing his ceiling right. as far as performance capabilities go. Yeah, he was the same way at Along, Spoleto, I remember. We went to Spoleto together, yeah. and he was the same way there. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure that was something he was doing for a long time, and it worked yeah. well for him. So I figured if it worked for him, I might as well give it a shot for myself. Yeah, it paid off. <laughs> it paid off. It paid yeah. off, and it'll pay off for other people too. Um, yeah. So kind of going along with that, um, there's this idea that I call musical voice. And that was something that I really worked on as I got more comfortable technically and more proficient at playing. The way I define my artistry is through my musical voice. And I cultivated that mostly by listening to my mentor and actually implementing the wisdom that they were imparting upon me okay. and trusting in my everyday journey. It's a really difficult thing to do, but knowing that going into the practice room every day was pushing me further and further towards my goals and that you know I wasn't looking for immediate gratification I don't think anyone who's in this field can expect immediate gratification mm -hmm. but knowing that I was trying to take slow and measured steps over time I was super fortunate to sit down with a jazz pianist named Mike Garson he's a family friend a friend of my aunt and he uh, was like one of David Bowie's pianists. He was in a military jazz band. I want to say the Navy, but I, I don't want to misquote. So I know he was stationed in New York uh, playing in a military combo and ended up touring with Bowie and doing all kinds of great stuff. And anyway, I went to his house and he shared with me that in all of his years in the music industry, which had been you know, 30, 35 years at that point, he had never met someone who wanted to cross the finish line badly enough and who didn't work hard enough that didn't make it. So what I'm saying is to hit this guy who was a seasoned professional in a wide variety of genres in the music world, all he said that it takes to cross the finish line is to want it badly enough and to work hard enough. And right. if, as long as you don't give up, you're going to get there. And that it was a huge, huge thing for me. I really embody that. And that's wisdom that I've shared with uh, countless people over the years. You know, I love telling that story. Mm -hmm. And the last part that kind of goes along with that is the skill of self-reflection. So in addition to trying to improve my weaknesses, the way to do that is to always be looking at the experiences that I was having as far as auditioning and ask myself what went wrong. You know, how can I prevent those weaknesses from interfering the next time I go to take an audition or do, you know, it doesn't have to be an orchestra audition. It could be a job interview. It could be a, a speech and, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, self-reflection, if you're putting yourself on the spot, putting yourself in a pressured situation in order to perform, I think self-reflection is a huge, huge attribute that's uh, required. And I worked really hard to kind of develop that skill. Awesome, dude. Uh, so. So I, I just want to go back to what you said when when you you took the wisdom from your your mentor and implemented it in your practicing. So you know we think about we think about taking lessons and you know your teacher is like, okay, do this, do this with your hands, play this, use this sticking. How how did you know to kind of in, how did you figure out how to interpret what they said, the wisdom they were imparting? Because it's it's sometimes mysterious, right? And you have to kind of do your own interpreting, your own translating, and how it works for you. So how did you go about doing that? 
Yeah, and this is something that I'm gonna I was planning to expand upon. So I appreciate okay. you kind of taking me in this direction here. Okay, cool. Well, so, real quick, real quick, uh, let me before we get into that, just let me let me acknowledge some people here. We got uh, Stan Muncy. Yeah. What's up, Stan? Dude, good to hear from Stan, you. Stan, what's going yeah. on, Stan? My good colleague and friend, Stan Muncy. Yeah, yeah. Stan and I go way back as well when he was at Colburn. We played together a ton. And yeah, such a great guy. Uh, Shane Nichols, he said, it's an amazing video. All of you killed it. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, everyone go check out that video of the rag time that Matt, the rag that Matt did. Greg Cohen, what's up? Stan Muncy said he felt the same way. I think he's talking about, I think I saw that comment pop up when I said I like felt such a sigh of relief when I heard that you had won, like someone had actually gone through every round uh, and won. Yeah, yeah, totally, Stan, I get it. Uh, Brandon you, Lapine, Stan. Brandon Lapine, do you know that person? Yeah, yeah, good buddy of mine. Hey, okay. Brandon, what's going he on, said, man? Thank says, you for yes, watching. Bryce. Yeah, dude, thanks, Brandon. Peter <laughs> Schler, dude. Peter, good to hear from you. Thanks, man. I really appreciate the support. Nier Cabaretti, conductor and music director of the Santa Barbara Symphony. Thanks for nice. checking in. Good to hear from you. Gordon LaCrosse. Hey, Nier. Thank you. Uh, Michael Danger Bassick. What's up, Michael? Mike. Uh, Stan Muncy, looking forward to next season. Yeah, I hope. Do you know, do you have any, really quickly, do you know when that's going to start? Do you guys have a plan in place for that? No, we don't have any plan in place yet. No. Okay. Okay, well, it's going to happen. We all know that. We all know that. It'll happen. Yeah. Oh, Pat. Pat. Hi, Pat. How are you doing? Okay, sorry to interrupt. Please continue. So so the wisdom, how to interpret the wisdom of your teachers into your own playing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was something that I, like I'm sure everyone else, struggled with. And I boiled that down to uh, a deeper sense of self-responsibility. So to me, the overall definition of self-responsibility when it comes to performing is that, and just in general, really, is that you have to take responsibility for the outcomes you produce. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's been to an orchestra audition or a percussion audition especially can hear people say, you know, oh, well, it was the hall and, oh, they didn't like my drum and, you know, this happened and that happened. And that those thoughts never ran through my mind when I was taking auditions, mm. uh, I was never looking at external factors and coming up with reasons why I didn't have the result that I wanted to. I was always looking at what I physically did, you know, uh, and sometimes it's easier to figure out than others. Sometimes you're like, well, I chunked a bunch of notes on xylophone, so mm. I've got to go back and do more green studies and mental manual calisthenics, the Buster Bailey book, you know, mm. things mm. like that. But, um, you know, making sure that you're always trying to evaluate what you're doing. And that includes, you know, taking on your teacher's feedback. So what the struggle that I had is not just always doing what your teachers tell you to do. And I've come across people in this industry, and I'm sure you have too, Eddie, who are like, well, this is how my teacher does this, or this is how we do it, you know, in this yeah. city, at this school, what, you know, whatever the, the what if is. Yeah, it can and be very And that was dogmatic. also something. It can be very dogmatic. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. I was never a dogmatic person or mm -hmm. player, and I'm still not, you know? Mm -hmm. So in addition to taking responsibility for this, I was always very open-minded. And I actually went too far in that extreme where I was in grad school flying around and taking lessons with people in all the top, you know, orchestras and things like that and going to festivals. Like I went to Aspen for the first time in 2017 mm -hmm. and there were nine faculty members that summer just because of their schedules with their other festivals and stuff. So we had new faculty coming in every two weeks wow. and I took lessons with all of them because yeah. I was like, I'm here. I want to learn. I want to do all this stuff. I started to get pretty jumbled up, man. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this person was telling me to do that. This person was telling me to do that. And I was trying to do it all. And I have to give a uh, huge credit and thank my teacher in grad school, Tim Janis, because mm -hmm. uh, I came back from Aspen that summer. I was a second year grad student. I started taking auditions for post-grad audition programs and was getting more feedback from the faculty members at these programs. And I'll never forget, this was so influential for me. I went to Tim and I said, Tim, what do you think is the biggest issue with my playing right now. And but it's a bold question. He looked at me. You know, I've told the story and people say that. You know, everyone's yeah, I mean, like that, wow. it takes a lot of bravery, but, man. Like no people I think people honestly, most people don't want to hear it, you know. They yeah. they just kind of want to Well, I appreciate that. turn a blind eye to it. So yeah, please. So you asked you yeah. you did it, you took that leap. So I asked, asked him. Question. Yeah, I, I took that leap and he said that he couldn't hear a Bryce 
in my playing, a Bryce Leafman. He heard 20 different ways that 20 different people have told me to play Kiji or do something, mm. and there was no individuality in my playing. And that doesn't resonate with people, you know. Uh, it sounds confusing almost, you know. And the last effect that I want to have on my audience when I'm playing is for them to be confused. Like, right. what just happened? You know, yeah. what what was that? And, um, yeah, so to Tim's credit, uh, he actually kind of stopped teaching me and said, I don't want you to come to lessons every week anymore, you know. Mm. Now that you've kind of opened this door up, he was like, I want to push you out of the nest a little bit and make you just kind of sit down and figure out this stuff on your own. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of set me off on this path of what I call musical voice, right? Okay. So then what do I do, right? I mean, I go into the practice room the next day and I'm just like totally lost and I felt like I was drowning a little bit because I had no idea if what I was doing was right and I was working really hard and putting in the hours like everyone does mm -hmm. and I just had no idea if it was the right thing to do and it was very disconcerting to me at the time but that's when I really started to value peer feedback and that's another huge thing uh, for me and another huge resource that I used along my audition path and in parsing out what your teachers tell you to do and what you want to do uh, is to get feedback from other people, especially people who don't do what you do. And I'm sure we've all been told this all the time, but mm -hmm. uh, I stopped playing for percussionists really, you know, I tried to stop playing for percussionists when I was in my master's. Obviously I would do mock auditions and play with other players and get their feedback, but I started to value the feedback of non-percussionists much more heavily around this time, which was mm -hmm. the second year of my master's. And the main reason for that is when we as percussionists take orchestra auditions, if there's a panel of 12 people, only two or three of them are gonna be percussionists right. and are gonna think like percussionists. And in all my conversations with other instrumentalists, we are an anomaly to them. They do not understand us. Right. They don't understand yeah. the way we think. They yeah. don't understand the things we do and the things that we think about, you know, and spend our yeah. time doing. Especially so when it comes to timpani, have... it's just like, oof, like they they don't know. It's so confusing to a non-percussionist to listen to someone play timpani out of context, just hearing, you know, one five one five one or whatever uh, outside of the context. Or they just don't know how to even grasp onto the pitch, really. So. That is part of the game. Right. The puzzle is figuring out how to make non-percussionists hear what you want them to hear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So all of this information was kind of being presented to me in the same time period mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of my master's degree where I was trying to just like figure out what my individual voice was, is. And I mean, that's a lifelong process, right? Yeah. So starting that journey, you know, figuring out how am I going to relate to these non-percussionists that are the majority of the committee whose votes I have to win if I'm going to secure a position in an mm -hmm. orchestra. And the thing that I want to say about this before we kind of keep going in this direction, sure. jumping back to self-responsibility, is that above all of this, I was working very carefully and very hard to stray away from what I consider a victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And I think this was a huge personal attribute that I cultivated that paid off in the long run. And I don't think I'm unique in saying that victim mentalities are so prevalent in our society these days. Like all you have to do is talk to someone in the grocery store or turn on the news. And the first thing they're going to do is tell you about all the bad things that are happening to them yeah. and the things they don't like. Yeah. And they don't take ownership of those things. Right. And so I adopted a belief that I had to take ownership of all the outcomes that I was producing, you know, and that I was saying, you know, uh, I, was, I was just thinking that included not being dogmatic, you know, just because my teacher tells me to do this thing one way. If I play for other people and they don't like it, you know, I'm not going to keep just trying to ram my head in the same direction just because my teacher said it. Yeah. So the the overarching thing that I I worked on was changing, right? And being open-minded. So mm -hmm. you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. We all know that's the definition of insanity, right? Right. right. So I did not want to go insane. I did not want to drive myself insane. Mm -hmm. And instead I got this, uh, idea that this is very prominent in Israeli society. My parents went to Israel and shared this experience that they had with Israel, which, which is that from a young age in Israel, 
students, young, young school students are taught to fail their way to the top. That failure is ultimately the greatest sign of success. Mm -hmm. And if you take those failures and you apply kind of everything that I'm talking about and you look at it reflectively and you're open minded about these things and you work to prevent them from ever happening again, eventually that's what's going to concretely push you to the finish line, at least in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I feel I feel like when you try and place blame on other outside sources or you make excuses, you just kind of spin your wheels and go in circles. Uh, you know, extreme ownership is kind of really the only way to to move forward. I think uh, I, I totally agree with you on that. That's that's a big part of my mentality as well. Is is you know even if it if it even if you might be ninety nine percent sure that something else caused what happened. It's like, well, whatever, I am taking 100% responsibility for that. And i am that's the only way you can really affect change and do anything about it. So, that, I mean, that's, that's awesome that you also uh, have that same belief. Uh, really quick, before we move too far Absolutely. away from it, Brandon Shantz, Shantz has a question. He says, non-joke question. Isn't there something to be said for just making good sounds and playing in time and in the character of the piece at the audition and all else is subject to the interpretation of the committee? Simply put, you have to be very lucky. How can you make your own luck to get to the, to get into, I think there's a typo, get into and at the audition? Uh, I, anyway, we'll, we'll answer the first part. Brandon, if you can clarify that last part. Um, but yeah, is there something to be said for just playing well and in time with character in the audition yes absolutely uh there is something to be said for that and this i'll, I'll kind of dovetail this into my idea of like developing a musical voice mm -hmm. as a teacher now uh and in the last couple you know years that i've been teaching i really try and instill the idea in my students that the right notes the right rhythms at the right time with good sounds are the bare bone essentials of music making. I think a lot of people think that those four things are the pinnacle of music making, and a lot of people will stop there once you know they feel like, okay, I played all the right notes, I played the right rhythms, it was in time, I didn't sound bad, whatever that means, objectively bad, right? right. Yeah. And then people think that's it. Right. And I, I came across that a lot. And so that will get you to a certain point. And when I started seeing a little bit of success on the audition circuit, I started making semifinal cuts and auditions that I was taking. I think those were the things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I consider those things uh, skills that will get you from the prelims to the semifinals. Absolutely. There is definitely something to be said for that. And they are essential, right? Bare bone essentials. Right. You, it's, you it's, won't it's start advancing without those yeah. things. Yeah. That, that's got to be in there. And, exactly. And, and you have to expect that everyone there is going to have that or anyone who stands a chance is, is going to have all those qualities. It's a given. So that's the next step, right, is now you're in the semifinal, right? You've checked the boxes. You have, you know, you're regularly making semifinals. That's what it was happening to me. But I was having trouble breaking through to finals. Mm -hmm. And when you get to finals, to get to finals and once you're in finals and hopefully trying to win uh, the job, that is in my experience, those four things aren't going to be what sets someone apart, right? There needs to be some other X factor, as I like to say, that's going to turn the committee's ear one way or another. And yeah, some of that takes luck. Like, uh, I'll get more into this, but uh, I want to kind of keep on track with the the musical voice. This is what I sure. call the musical voice, sure. right? Yeah. So on. I think Brandon use the word character in the best way possible. So outside of right notes, right rhythm, right time, good sounds, things that we can do. Bring character, right? Music is an art form. And there's so many different ways to interpret this. So I started taking on the question, how can I make the character of this music come to life? And my most recent mentor, Ed Steffen, I think sums this up in the best way that I've ever heard anyone say. Mm -hmm. His overarching question that he asks himself whenever he's playing, whether it's in an audition, a master class, a competition, a lesson, it doesn't matter what performance experience you're about to have. The overarching question that he has and asks is, what experience do I want my audience to have? And it was once I started adopting that mindset that I started to really uh, see more success on the audition circuit. So 
going back to bringing the, the the character of the music to life, it was actually uh, someone you may be pretty familiar with, Joe Pereira, yeah. who helped me kind of consolidate this idea. I was at Aspen, and mm. you know, Joe Pereira said, "You want to make the committee hear the orchestra around you." And mm. a lot of people have said that, but he was the first one that I heard say that. And so mm. I attribute that as a, a, a Joe Pereira-ism that yeah. stuck very strongly in my brain. Okay, character means making the committee hear the orchestra around you. A lot of people also say you want to make the committee feel like they can play with you. Mm. I think that's the same thing, that they can imagine sitting next to you or sitting in front of you and playing along with you. So in order – do that, what I found for myself is that I needed to learn to play the instruments and not play the repertoire. Hmm. So I had made a commitment to myself when I started college that I was going to do whatever it took to cross the finish line. And whatever that meant for me, you know, for me, that meant winning a full time position in a professional orchestra. I didn't care what orchestra it was. All I wanted was full time employment in a symphony orchestra. Yeah. That was my ultimate goal. Yeah. So uh, and how do you do that? You play excerpts for auditions, right? Yeah. So I went to college thinking excerpts, 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 and I just pounded them over and over and over again for years and years and years. And, you know, it got progressively better as I just got more comfortable with it and more familiar. But I found that that could only get me so far that there was a very low ceiling when it came to that kind of practice and that mentality. And when I was in grad school, I started not playing excerpts anymore mm -hmm. and instead trying to play the instrument. So for me, that meant method books, that meant solos, different, you know, genres, rudimental and orchestral snare drumming, uh, xylophone rags and De La Clue xylophone etudes, you know, uh, Bailey blues etudes on xylophone, you know, just all different kinds of things. And when you're able to embody different styles of music through, you know, the grip that you use, the amount of pressure in your hand, the stroke type, all these like concrete things that we think about as percussionists. Yeah. Where beating spots are a huge thing. What implement you're going to use. Uh, Ed has another idea that I really took on, which is where you hit it, how you hit it, and what you hit it with as key uh, choices to make when you're yeah. talking about invoking character, right? Mm -hmm. And so once I put my attention totally in that direction, that's when I started developing the skills to bring the character to life. So then once I had the idea of, okay, I can kind of make different sounds, you know, sounding good, what does good mean? You know, can I sound legato on xylophone? Can I sound staccato? Can I play loud? Can I play soft? Can I play bright? Can I play dark? What are all the different variables that I could possibly imagine? And can I do them? Mm -hmm. And that's, those are weaknesses. If you can't do them, right? I was talking about capitalizing on weaknesses when we first got started. Right. So if I identified that I couldn't play legato on xylophone, which is difficult, it's not a legato instrument, right. you know, but to kind of convey the idea of legato playing, for me, that was with stroke types, right? More horizontal stroke types rather than very vertical up and down at all different dynamics playing legato, that is, mm -hmm. then that was a weakness that I needed to remedy. Right. And so and you can definitely a lot hear the... that. You can hear when, even though xylophone makes a very short sound and it only decays and it decays very rapidly, you can really hear someone play like a very lyrical passage on xylophone. It, it's really, it's kind of a magic. It's kind of like a feeling that you make someone feel. It's like you're, you're, it's like inception. You're implanting a feeling into someone's brain on this instrument that really has no place playing a legato passage. And that, that's just kind of right. the magic we have to work in the audition. Exactly. Yeah. And, and things like, you know, figuring out where to put emphasis, putting the emphasis on the start of a run, which kind of makes it connect to the end, different things like that. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to get too into how to play legato xylophone, but right, right, you know, no, no, it's no. that just that kind of thinking is the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. Uh, which really gave me the skills to then play the character. So then once I could make these different colors and have these different effects and, and you test that by playing for people, right? Like, you know, does the sound go to a flute player and ask, does the xylophone passage sound like God of flute players? You know, it's a beautiful instrument. They can connect their long notes with their breath. I feel like I would go to instruments that were emblematic of the effect that I was trying to achieve and ask them if I was achieving it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, that that's a so smart then, thing to do. Like, that's a very, I mean, I think that's, that's crucial to, to get other to get feedback from other instrumentalists. It's, it's absolutely crucial to audition success for sure. Right. 
Right. So then once I was starting to kind of feel more comfortable with that, then I went back to the orchestral repertoire and I would listen to the music and think about, okay, do, what does this sound like to me? And it's hard to turn off what uh, Jake Nisley calls it teacher brain. And mm. for those of you who don't know who Jake Nisley is, he's the principal percussionist of San Francisco Symphony, former principal percussionist of the Cleveland Orchestra, principal percussionist of the Detroit Symphony. Yeah. So a dude with a resume who sounds like he knows what he's talking about, right? right. Yep. And he said that after being in these orchestras for over 10 years, he's still struggling with turning off teacher brain and doing things the way that his teachers told him, even though he's held major principal positions for you know more than 10 years. So it's something we all struggle with, but trying to figure out what it means to you and mm -hmm. just going back, listening to the music, taking these skills that you've worked so hard to develop and figuring out how you're going to implement them to bring this music to life. You know, what are you going to hit it with? How are you going to hit it? Where are you going to hit it? Stroke type, mallet choice, beating spots are all the, the concrete things that I started to explore with to add character to my playing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. I, I actually, there's a topic I just thought of, because I remember when, when I was asking about your hobbies, when we were messaging back and forth and you mentioned that you read books about epigenetics. I thought that was so interesting. So I don't, I don't know a ton about epigenetics, but tell me if I'm right. So basically epigenetics is the study of how genes express themselves basically. And, and, and like, there's like genetic markers that tell a certain cell how to express a certain piece of DNA and that we actually have a lot more control over that than previously thought to affect, you know, like we're not, we're not, uh, we may be predisposed to something, but we are not predestined to experience something based on our genes. And I, and you said that had a role in this audition process. So I'd love to hear about that and, and how you use that. I yeah, absolutely. And and so you're totally right. Um, the prefix epi means above, mm -hmm. genetics meaning genes. So the study of epigenetics is going above the genes. Like you were saying, we have proteins in our cells that actually activate different responses through our genes. They actually turn cells on and off that actually affects which genes in our DNA are being expressed at any given point. Mm -hmm. And so I got really into this idea when I was an undergrad. And the part of epigenetics that I took on and what put me down this rabbit hole is that what we are in control of and what changes which cells are expressed and which genes are expressed is the environment that they're in. Hmm. So on a cellular level, a uh, microbiological level, the environment is our blood chemistry, right? And so that has to do with the foods that we eat, how much water we drink our exercise regimen. That's one of the reasons exercise has been so important to me is it really affects the environment of my inner being. Mm -hmm. The other really important thing for me is thoughts. And that's where I kind of dovetailed into the audition circuit. So okay. we now know that you can't have a negative thought without having a negative biological response. Mm. If you turn on the news and you hear bad news, you know, some people get anxiety, right? That's a very easy example. You hear something, it makes you anxious. I call that a negative response. I try to avoid anxiety-inducing experiences in my life. Uh, call me Mr. Positive, but that's yeah. just me. Yeah. These are the kinds of things that I was uh, talking about. So the uh, – and like you were saying, the part of epigenetics that is empowering to me is that we have the power to change this. So – going back to the victim mentality, we are not a victim of our genes. Like you said, we may be predetermined, but we are not predestined. And that kind of coalesced this victim mentality uh, with the cellular response, right? So that led me to thinking, okay, how can I change my thoughts about anything in my life? You know, I, in general, people who know me will say, I'm a pretty positive person. I've been called Mr. Eager Beaver before, you know, <laughs> and uh, I actually take that as a compliment as silly and maybe slightly embarrassing as that is. But it's something that I work very hard on every single day and something that I've worked very hard on over many, many years of my life. Mm -hmm. And so constantly monitoring the kinds of thoughts that I was having in life in general, but especially around auditions, also opened up a weakness to me. I saw and I 
in myself and in other people who I would hear talk about auditions and who are taking auditions and especially people who quit the circuit. Remember, my goal was to not quit. Mm -hmm. Mike Garson said, just don't quit. And so I was like, okay, well, what can I do to keep myself going and keep myself from quitting? And so I started studying my subconscious mind and getting into a little bit of this is where the quantum physics really comes in. And this is also where the neuroscience that I'm passionate about comes in and, and just the psychology in general. So we have to be very, very careful about what we allow our mind to tell us. Our mind is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, I think for all of us, really, it can be a very dangerous thing. Yeah. And that was something that I tried to mitigate as early and as quickly as possible. And through my reading on these topics, I came, I came across a metaphor that I really loved, which is that, uh, well, first of all, I found out that the subconscious mind controls about 97% of our brain activity every day, that we're, on average, the average human being is only consciously controlling about 3% of what they're thinking, mm -hmm. essentially. We're only conscious of about 3% of what our brain is actually doing. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, huge majority of th things that are going on that are affecting our inner system, you know, in an epigenetic kind of fashion, that we are not actively controlling. We are responsible for, but we're not actively controlling. Mm -hmm. So I started to wonder, well, what can I do? How can I take ownership over that? What can I do to change that? And I came across this metaphor, which is that our subconscious is a tape player. So from the time that we're born until the time we die, our subconscious is going around in circles, recording everything that happens. Every thought we have, every word we speak, every emotion we feel is all being recorded in our subconscious. And that's what's being used for 97% of our brain activity. That sounds really scary and very daunting. <laughs> yeah. But the amazing part about this metaphor of the tape recorder is that the tape is constantly being recorded, which implies we can rewrite was being played on the tape. So there was a book in my San Francisco audition process called The Success Principles that I followed very closely, and I can maybe get into that more about the, the San Francisco process mm -hmm. especially, but the very first chapter is about taking self-responsibility, and the author Jack Canfield has an equation that I think sums this up perfectly. The equation is event plus response equals outcome. Mm -hmm. So. There are going to be events in our life that we have no control over. A lot of events in our life that we don't have control over. Yeah. What we do have control over is our response to those things. We have complete control over how we respond to those things. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to produce our result because how we respond to things is what gets recorded in our subconscious, which is then played out through 90%, 97% of our brain activity every day, right? Take that to auditions. Yeah. This is what I called uh, a huge part of my path. I called it normalizing the audition process. Okay. You know, I a lot of people think all you have to do is think of the word audition and people immediately have a fear-based response. A lot of people do. Mm -hmm. You know, they get nervous, they start processing negative thoughts. I don't like auditions. Auditions are scary. Some people have physical reactions. Their hands will start shaking. Their palms will get sweaty. You know, you can induce. This is epigenetics on a biological level. We have a thought and then our body responds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to change that. Make sure that whenever I had a thought about auditions, music, whatever it was I was trying to do, I wanted to make it a positive thought. So I kind of broke auditions down into two components. Okay. There was the technical side of auditioning, which is how you're playing and all the, the musical skills and tactile things I was talking about earlier that I was trying to develop on the instruments. Mm -hmm. And then what I call the mind, body, spirit side. And it's very important to be broken down into those three things. You can't only feed the mind or only feed the body or only feed the spirit. They are one harmonious system. It, it's I've read, you know, scientifically, this seems to be the consensus in the mm -hmm. scientific community. This also seems is my personal consensus that these three things are integrated. So for me, mind is, you know, the correct use. Of, I call this, you know, the correct use of your intellect. How am I directing my brain in every moment? How am I responding to everything that happens? Am I, you know, having a positive response? 
you can't uh, no one's perfect you know mm -hmm. i ended up driving myself a little crazy with this and really beating myself up when i was caught myself processing negative thoughts yeah uh which is not the right thing to do and it's right. not a healthy mindset to have yeah. you know so it's it's always it's a constant balancing act and something that again i'm still working on and will always be working on but you know, using your intellect correctly, trying to have positive responses, just trying, being aware of it is a huge step. Mm -hmm. Also, being aware of when your mind is working against you. So there would be times when I was preparing for an audition where I'd be in the practice room, but my mind would be thinking about 15 other things going on outside of the practice room, mm -hmm. be distracting me. And I'd be putting a lot of mental energy into all these other things that weren't directly related to what I was trying to accomplish in the practice room. So I had to develop a structure for myself of, you know, when I'm in the practice room, I'm going to be thinking about music. I'm going to be focusing on music. And then I'm going to set aside what I call office hours to deal with all the other things in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, a lot of the, the solutions to these problems that I'm describing was having a structure. I found that my brain, and I think this applies to a lot of people is put at ease when there's a plan in place. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I found myself struggling mentally, I thought, okay, let me plan this out. Let me figure it out. And if I was in the practice room and I was freaking out, I went to a calendar, I put down when I was going to address all these things I was freaking out about. And it was off my mind. My subconscious went, okay, we're going to take care of those things. My conscious mind took over. I told my subconscious mind what was going to happen. And it put my subconscious mind at ease. And I was able to kind of go back to what I was trying to accomplish in the practice room. Okay. So that's the mind part. Body part, obvious rest, you know, relaxation, mm -hmm. exercise. You know, I love the metaphor that musicians are like Olympic athletes. You know, we use our bodies very intensely for hours and hours a day, most of us seven days a week. Uh, we're very hard on our bodies. So we need to do the proper things to rest, recover, recuperate, make sure we're in tip top shape, eating well, you know, always making sure there's good fuel in the engine, not going too long between having meals. That was something I would get wrapped up in the practice room. It'd be seven hours since I ate a meal. All of a sudden my mind was completely fatigued, fogged over. I hit a wall cause I hadn't eaten, mm -hmm. you know, regularly enough. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I'm always, uh, monitoring as well. And then what I call the spirit side has to do with how I went about my day every day. And these are things that I was honing most before my San Francisco process. I, for, for the San Francisco audition, really bought into this idea that there are three ways to form a habit. There's what I call, uh, this is what I call inspiration versus doingness. And that's the barometer that I use to mon monitor where my spirit was at. So first there's willpower. Mm. that's doing this. I'm just going to force myself to do this thing because I feel like I should do it. And I have a lot of willpower that got me through a lot of my life and a lot of my career, uh, my schooling really as a musician was sheer willpower. It's like, I'm going to be in the practice room because I feel like this is what I should be doing. And I'm just going to make myself do it. And that I found, you know, eventually hit that ceiling of mm. willpower, you know, that comes out as in your music playing as yeah. an expression. It's a, it's a finite resource for sure. So, it's a willpower is a yeah, definitely right. finite so, needs, needs recovery. Definitely needs recovery takes a lot of energy, right? We only have so much energy in the day. Mm -hmm. So in addition to trying to optimize my strategy for the playing side of auditions, I was trying to optimize this other side. How can I make the most of the energy that I have every day? Where am I expending too much energy? Is it mentally? Is my mind just running? Is it in you know the spirit side where I'm just forcing myself to be here? That takes a lot of energy to, to force my body, my spirit to, mm -hmm. to do this thing, right? So there's willpower. Next is automatic behavior, where maybe you've put in enough willpower that you become very neutral about doing this. Like, okay, I'm pretty cool with just being in the practice room for four to six hours a day. I've done it enough. Now I, I, I don't feel like I'm forcing myself to do it, but I'm just neutral about it. And then the, the highest form of that for me is self-inspiration. And that's what I was striving for in the process for San Francisco. Self-inspiration, meaning I was excited to get to the end of the day. I was excited to do an inventory of all the things that I did that day, the places that I found improvement, celebrate those things, and get up and do it again the next day. Mm. And that is kind of the peak uh, mental state that I found myself in that I feel like helped me get through this long audition process for the San Francisco Symphony. Okay. So just to kind of recap, uh, the, 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 the mindset, the awareness of what your brain is doing is a crucial step. Like first just kind of take 
take moments throughout your day to be aware of how you're thinking. Second, you said you were yeah. Free. What tone are my thoughts taking? Okay. You know what is the tone? That's that's identifying the tone of your thoughts. Okay, so identifying the tone of your thoughts, and then when your mind is kind of spinning, it helps to write things down, like consciously write things down. And then when you were talking about habit forming, you actually at the end of your long practice day, you go and recap the day, like your your kind of like highlight reel for the day, and kind of pump yourself up for the next day and celebrate yourself, kind of give yourself a pat on the yeah. back for a job so- well done. Right, right. So uh, I want to kind of take that and now go specifically into San Francisco and kind of the things that I was doing for that right. audition. Just really that quick, was a though. combination of all. Yeah, just yeah, really, yeah, yeah. really quickly. Sorry. I know we're, we're coming up on an hour. I think we might go long today. Uh, everyone who's commented and asked a question, uh, I want I want Bryce to talk about his, his audition experience and then we'll get to your questions and comments. Sure. Uh, promise. But yeah, so please go ahead. Absolutely. So Again, this is kind of the culmination of uh, everything that I've described, you know, the tactile improvements I was making, the mindset improvements I was making, and uh, my process for San Francisco Symphony. So uh, the auditions that I took right before San Francisco were Billings in April of 2019. I won that position. Um, Montreal, where I was one of four finalists for Mm -hmm. that position, and then San Francisco. So Mm -hmm. like I said, kind of incremental improvements and looking back. Uh, and trying to figure out what I could do best. So for San Francisco, I wanted to be as diligently organized as possible. I've always been a pretty organized person and I had a practice journal and would take notes, you know, very regularly, almost daily Hmm. to keep track of all those things. But it was very uh, technically focused and it didn't incorporate all these other things that I just spent some time talking about. Hmm. So I put together what I called a dream journal for San Francisco. And that's, uh, I have it right here, actually. Awesome. And in, it's in my dream binder, I should say, because mm-hmm. it's literally just a $2 Target uh, half-inch binder. Perfect. But I filled this binder with uh, a bunch of things, you know, affirmations. Why, what, why am I doing this? You know, what are the goals that I have? What, what, what do I want and how is taking this audition going to help me? Um, the last thing I want to say about normalizing auditions is that a big part of it is letting go of expectations. So someone commented that you kind of have to be lucky to win an audition. Mm -hmm. And there is truth to that. You know, what, what I say is that ultimately the result is out of your hands, right? You're playing for a committee of people. Music is subjective. If you're blue and they want red, there's nothing you can do about that. You could be the best blue that there is in the world, but if they want red, they want red. So part of the normalization of my audition process was letting go of expectations. So taking the focus out of winning the audition And not focusing on the end result, but instead writing down affirmations about what I was doing, what I was working on, how this is helping me grow as a human being, how I'm becoming a happier, better person, you know, uh, things like that. I created what I was what I call a mind map. I'm going to hold this up to the screen. It's a bubble chart. So in the middle, it says what my goal is. And my Mm -hmm. goal was to win the San Francisco Symphony Audition. So I never went into an audition not wanting to win. But I didn't put winning as the focus. So the saying that I developed for that is that I had high intentions and low expectations. Mm. I intended to do everything I possibly could to secure that position. And it didn't matter to me if it was Billing Symphony in Montana, St. Louis Symphony, San Francisco Symphony. I approached every audition this way. It didn't matter. Regional audition, full, you know tier one, mid tier, it didn't matter. This was my approach, Mm -hmm. that I always had the highest intentions to represent myself as best as I could. I put a lot of emphasis for me on my musical voice. My goal was always to, the game that I created was how well can I express my musical voice when I was on stage? Mm -hmm. And some people will like it, some people won't. So what next? Right. That was kind of the ideology that I developed around that, that I just wanted to present my musical voice in the best way possible, better than I did the last time. Mm -hmm. So I have this bubble chart that says I want to win, you know, the San Francisco Symphony Audition. And then I came up with all these different things around it that I thought would help me towards this goal. And then they have offshoots, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these things say um, I will support my practicing by nourishing my mind and body. That was part of what was going to help me win. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to try and know as much as possible so as not to be surprised on the day of the audition. Mm. You know, look up pictures of the hall. Imagine what it's going to be like to be there. Know how many people uh, are try and figure out, you know, how many people are going to be there approximately. Just figure out as much as you can. Plan and make the highest and best use of my time. Have a plan and stick to it and strategize. And that was, you know, those are a couple of things. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they weren't winning related. They weren't even just music related. It was what I was going to do outside of the practice room mostly to set myself up in the best position to express my musical voice and as well as musically what was going to happen. It was about 50-50, you know? Yeah. And then no, this is very I great. It's like, wrote... it's like a, you have a very spiritual approach to, to auditions. And it's great for people who are just kind of mired in the, the precision and accuracy and the, the technical aspects and just getting too obsessed with those things. Obviously, those things are crucial. You want to have those as a given, but uh, there you you can't it, there can be you can't be overdone. You can over practice that stuff, and and that's when your spiritual side and your body really takes a toll, and you start to have diminishing returns. So it's great that you're really emphasizing this spiritual approach, and that it brought you this result, like one of the best jobs in the world. It's incredible. And that's really what I believe is that this kind of approach and this kind of mentality is what ultimately got me across the finish line for this specific position. That's awesome. Um, that's really so thank awesome. you. I appreciate yeah, of it. course. That's so yeah. cool. Uh, I, I just uh, want to get to question. Did, did you want to uh, go deeper into that really briefly? Because we're coming up on an hour. I, I just yeah, let me just wrap this up time. a little bit. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, other things in the binder, I have reminders to myself, just little thoughts, inspirational quotes, things like that that really helped. Another thing that's really big for the subconscious is images. Mm -hmm. So I have pictures of me. I got to sub with the San Francisco Symphony once before I took the audition. And I had friends in the audience who took snapshots of me on stage. Oh, nice. And so I put that in my binder and I could imagine myself right. on stage uh, being, you know, in the section and uh, using that for my subconscious. I also made the background of my phone Davies Symphony Hall mm. so that anytime I looked at my phone, I felt like I was in Davies Hall and just overwhelming my subconscious with images in addition to just words like thoughts that I was having. And then the last and most important part that I wanted to share today uh, about the Dream Binder is that I, for the musical side, I got this from the success principles. This doesn't have to do with just music. This has to do with any goal setting. Mm -hmm. If you plan your night out if you plan your day out the night before, you are much better off to have successful results in any goal that you're trying to achieve. Mm. The period before you go to sleep is the prime period to reprogram your subconscious. When we're kind of half dazing, half dozing, that's when our subconscious is most receptive to new information. Mm. So like you were saying, at night I would kind of psych myself up. I went through this binder every night and I read my reminders, my affirmations, and then most importantly, I charted out what I was going to do the next day. Wow. I charted out, you could see what instrument I was going to play oh, yeah. for how long in yeah. the order that I was going to play it for every single day. Wow. So all I had to do was go into the practice room the next day and do what I had written down the night before to the minute, you know, mm. to the minute. And obviously it was just a constant uh, adjustment. You know, it's not perfect at all. Right. But having that plan and that level of organization, and I've always, like I said, I'm a plan-oriented guy. I knew I could execute on that, mm -hmm. and I did for the most part. Um, I'm going to share one thing. This is the last thing I'll share. There sure. were two weeks in January. They're really, really filled in. And there was a period in January in between the finals – or the semifinal and the finals where – I felt like maybe I wasn't practicing enough. And so I was going to push myself even harder. So instead mm -hmm. of being in the room for four hours a day, I went to eight hours a day. Wow. And I did that for two weeks. And then I had a crazy, crazy burnout. Yeah. My spirit just was like obliterated, like yeah. evaporated. And I'm really lucky that I was able to go to Billings at the end of those two weeks. And Billings to me was kind of like a reset button. Mm -hmm. I was able to totally rest and rejuvenate and get away from the audition. And that's what it always was for me when I went, like you said, I went every month. We do uh, 11 sets a year out there for a week mm -hmm. a month. And, um, and I was able to kind of recover from that in enough time before finals to kind of reaffirm. So, you know, there, this is always going to be an up and down and it's a constant adjustment and a struggle. And I pushed myself too hard. I burned out. I was fortunate enough that I had enough time to recover. But like you were saying, the reason I wanted to bring this up is you can go too far and saying, I have to drill this for eight hours a day. I have to do this. I have to do that. 
that kind of thinking proved detrimental for my audition process mm -hmm. uh, at, a, at a certain point. You have to have, be disciplined and put in the time and put in the work and put in the hours, but that's not the only thing that's going to get you there. Right. And if you're upset, if you're miserable, if you're burnt out, it comes out in your playing. Yeah, for sure. I, that's 100% accurate. Uh, okay, so it's six o'clock. I want to get to questions and comments, but I, I really, I really want to hear about the audition timeline, like prelims, semis, yeah. and then that two month period, and then finals for San Francisco. So if there's a way you can make that as concise as possible, like squeeze that into like five, five minutes or so, just a brief overview yeah. of that audition experience, that would be great. Absolutely. I'll be very quick, probably less than five minutes. Okay. I appreciate the extra time. Editing. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I started prepping. I wanted at least a three-month prep process for San Francisco. I was fortunate that Montreal ended in May and San Francisco was in November. Mm -hmm. That's more, a greater chunk of time than I had had to prepare for my last 14 auditions. I was taking an audition almost at the rate of every other month for two years before San Francisco was announced. Okay. And so I had very short prep periods. So yeah. I wanted the long prep period. So three months before November, it was November 4th, uh, was prelims was August 4th. So I started in August and I, you know, I didn't have the binder going quite at that point, but I was kind of working out those things. I played prelims on the fourth. I felt good about it. I felt like I represented my musical voice and I got a call that I made it to semis the next day, went back, played my semifinal round. I didn't feel so hot about it to be totally <laughs> honest. I thought it could have kind of gone either way mm. um, and was just super fortunate and blessed to get a call that night that I had been advanced to the finals. So, you know, you don't were count red, yourselves You were down red and they were looking red. You were, that was perfect. Exactly. You were in the right spot. The, the element exactly. of luck was on your yeah, side for that round. It was. It really was. And it was a big lesson in just never counting yourself out, you know, especially mm -hmm. during the round. You have to just kind of go at it and never just be like, well, OK, screw this or, you know, whatever. I don't isn't going my way and give up on yourself because you don't know what they're thinking. And apparently I spoke well enough to them that day that I got through to the final round. So then there was this two month gap three month gap. It was from November 5th until February 17th. So it was a little more than three month gap. That's how much time I had put into preparing the entire list for the prelim round. Right. We found out uh, a couple months into that process that they were going to give a shorter list. I feel like it was probably around January, mm -hmm. shortly after New Year's, we got sent a shorter list. So we didn't have to play, you know, the huge 165 page audition book anymore. Mm -hmm. So when I found that I had another three months, I was like, okay, I just have to hit the reset button and kind of take a break from it all. You know, I was putting in a lot of energy and effort and feeling myself hitting the wall, right, uh, feeling myself about to hit the wall before prelims and semis. Luckily I didn't. And so I was like, I know I got to take a step back. That's where the binder came in. So I started mm -hmm. charting out every day. So I just went back to the basics. I was still practicing every day, probably still at least four hours a day in the practice room, but I was doing calisthenics and hands work and solos. I wasn't playing ex excerpts for at least a month mm -hmm. between the semifinal round and the final round. Okay. And then I kind of slowly started ramping that stuff back up. And then two months later, when we got the final audition list, it was very easy to kind of incorporate excerpts back into my daily practice because I had a much more digestible list. Uh, so from the mental side of things, I was going into this final round as the only candidate to have made it from the prelims to the finals. Mm -hmm. There were two other candidates with me that made it from the semifinal to the final. And then there were three more people who were being invited straight to the finals. Mm -hmm. So the people who were in the finals were from the Dallas Symphony, the Toronto Symphony, the Minnesota Orchestra, the Metropolitan Opera, um, the Detroit Symphony, and Bryce Leafman from the Billing Symphony, right? <laughs> right yeah. So <laughs> definitely kind of the dark horse at this point in the audition process. And I think that's part of why I embraced the mental side of this audition so much more is, you know, I didn't think I was going to go in and play these guys under the table. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all highly, highly accomplished players who all bring incredible amounts of talent and skill to the table. So I was trying to develop an, uh, a mindset around what can I bring to set myself apart. And for me, it was, you know, this, this mental thing and this, the musical voice and everything like that. So we went to February 17th and all six of us played. Mm -hmm. And that day, uh, I found out that I had been advanced to a fourth round, a super final round mm. with one other candidate. And that was going to be a chamber round. So the screen came down for the chamber round and 
Ed Steffen, who's the principal timpanist of the symphony, and Jake Nisley, who's the principal percussionist, and Tom Hemphill, who is a section percussionist, now retired. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he was re going to retire in June, but mm -hmm. season's over. So he is now retired. Mm -hmm. uh, they were sitting behind the screen for the finals. They came up on stage, and we played with the section. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the committee sat at tables at the front of the stage. We were at the back of the stage. And it was mostly repertoire, not from the audition list. Okay. Esapeka was there. Okay. Uh, we had to play solo uh, without Esapeka conducting. Then we had to play solo with Esapeka conducting. He was mm. conducting Magic Flute that week. Okay. Uh, not Magic Flute. I'm sorry, Mother Goose. Okay. Mother Goose. Okay. Uh, so we had to play Mother Goose Glockenspiel solo with Esapeka conducting. Wow. And then uh, we did Symphony Fantastique fourth movement with Ed, just the two timpani part. Mm hmm. We did Fanfare for the Common Man with Jake on bass drum, Ed on timpani, uh, doubling the... Uh, so I played timpani with Jake on bass drum, and then I played bass drum with Ed on timpani. Okay, okay. We switched it out, and then we did a full section, track four. Mm -hmm. uh, we played cymbals, and the section filled out the rest of, uh, of track four. Wow. So... Yeah, yeah, and we had about 10 minutes. You know, they just wanted to go. Yeah. So I, I was fortunate I got to go second because I played after this other candidate in the final round. So they kept him first in the super final and me second because that's how we showed up in the final round. Mm -hmm. So I had about 10 minutes to get ready. That's nice. Um, yeah, 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 it was very nice. Kind of nice. regroup kinda just a little bit. Head in the right space. Yeah. Yeah, I regroup a little bit. So then uh, that happens, and we're waiting, and it's like obviously super nerve-wracking. And uh, someone from personnel comes out and says that the committee has qualified both of us for the position. Mm. So the committee's voting portion of the audition was done, and we now had to go to an orchestra round to be solely decided by Esapeka. Okay. So this was, you could call it luck, you could call it, you know, I don't know what, but this is like, to me, the embodiment of the example that I talked about where it's totally out of your hands. Mm -hmm. And it went from the committee's hands to the music director's hands, yeah. even further out of my hands, you yeah. know? So th I, I, the committee did their part and then that was it. And so I, it was yet another X factor that I had to go through. And I had a week to get ready for the orchestra round. So at this point, it had been seven months since I started preparing for the audition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was really looking forward to it being done on February 17th. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had <laughs> been working really hard for seven months. Yeah. That's the longest I'd ever prepped for any audition or anything like that. And I thought it was going to be over. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was a little disheartened that I had to go another week. But I picked yeah. myself up really quickly, nice. got ready to go, went back the next week and played an orchestra round. It was timpani only. I heard okay. that Esapek is very particular about his timpani sound. Yeah. So we did five excerpts, uh, full orchestra. They blocked out uh, the last 30 minutes of a rehearsal mm -hmm. for me and the other candidate. We went two days apart mm -hmm. on separate days, back-to-back -back days. Uh, not two days apart, back-to-back -back days. Right. And I played the five excerpts, and to me, it was the most out-of-body experience I've ever had Amen. in an audition. It was just boom, 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 boom. I only had to do one thing over, a fifth excerpt, which was check four on timpani. Mm -hmm. as, a peck, as a peck asked me to make one change. I did the thing, and he, you know, I thought I had a 30-minute block. It was maybe seven minutes. Oh, wow. You know, five excerpts, that's probably yeah. five minutes of playing. Yeah. And then I had to do some tuning changes and stuff. So I would guess probably seven or eight minutes, and it was wow. over. It's just like, oh my God, what happened? And when when did you get uh, the call? So ironically, the symphony was playing Nielsen Five that night, mm. and Esapeka was conducting, and I had bought tickets for that concert months before, mm -hmm. thinking the audition would be over February seventeenth, right. and win, lose, or draw, I was going to go see Nielsen Five and yeah. just enjoy it, no, no yeah. matter what. I was going to enjoy the snare drum cadenza Jake was going to play, and right. and just enjoy the piece. So I went to the concert that night, <laughs> uh, which was a little interesting. And uh, <laughs> I was up in the, the second tier way in the back, you know, yeah. and um, the concert got out and I got a text message from Jake Nisley, who said, come backstage. And I walked back around the hall. Um, I had told Ed and Jake that I was going to be at the concert. I didn't want anyone to think that there was any foul play going on or anything right. like that. Right. I just told them I bought tickets months ago, I'm going to be there. And, you know, they said, okay, whatever. They didn't care, you know, but right. I, I wanted to do my, my due justice to, to make it not look funny. Yeah. So, uh, they knew I was at the concert. I got a text to come backstage and they were still in their tuxes. You know, they just walked off stage. All the orchestra was backstage kind of packing up and I got walked into the personnel office and offered the position. Esapeka couldn't be there, unfortunately, because mm. he had to do a post-concert lecture. Oh, so okay. he was, 
shepherded back out on stage. So I walked into the personnel office and uh, was offered the position. Wow, man. What a dream come true. That is that's that is amazing. That is, that is such like a fairy tale ending. Uh, that's so incredible. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. So let's get to like a couple questions really quickly before we sign off here. Uh, near Cabaretti, your process to win the audition is inspiring. I wonder how does it feel the day after? What's the next dream? That's a great question, Nir. And it's great. We've emailed. I don't know if you remember me, but hi, I'm Bryce. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Virtual handshake. Yeah, sorry, Nir. We uh, never got him down to Santa Barbara, but uh, maybe you can go up and see him in San Francisco. When, when you for have sure, to that would be great. Nir, yeah. let me know if you do. Um, <laughs> You know, I'd spent a lot of time with the subconscious trying to imagine what it would feel like waking up on February 18th, having won the position. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being uh, later than February 18th. But, uh, you know, it, it took a couple of days. I was just starstruck. You know, I, I didn't have any expectations about winning the position. You know, I was going mm -hmm. in with just the idea of trying to represent myself and my musical voice the best way possible. Yeah. So I think I was just in a, a state of just awe and gratitude, you know, being able to take the next day off and wrapping my mind around the fact that I don't have to take any more auditions if I don't want yeah. to, which yeah. I don't, that thought had never crossed my mind before. Right. Um, but the ultimate, the go the next goal that I have is the same goal that I've always had. So in my quarantine time, I've tried to, I looked back at the audition, even though I was very fortunate to win the position mm -hmm. and identify my weaknesses and say, what held me back in that audition, you know? And that's what I've been tackling during my coronavirus time, as well as making time for just other projects that are just inspiring that I never had the time to do when I was practicing mm -hmm. excerpts. Mm -hmm. I'm improvising again on vibraphone for the first oh, time nice. in like six years. I used to play Great. a lot of jazz vibes. I let that go when I started taking auditions. Mm -hmm. So I'm improvising again. I'm doing a lot of sight reading, which is something I always wanted to do for myself. Um, and then just, yeah, tackling different things, technical things uh, that I feel like w didn't represent myself the best in the San Francisco audition that I want to kind of keep improving on. Awesome, man. So, so the goal is constant improvement. Until until yeah. the day you retire, constant improvement. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly great. That's right. the way to go, dude. That's the way to go. That's how you keep a job like that. Congre that that's yeah. great. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Jeff Collinson, brilliant discussion. Thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Diana Morgan, my wife. Can Bryce share some book titles for further reading on subconscious epigenetics mindset? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just I have them ready to go. So the oh, okay. book that I used specifically for San Francisco Symphony is called The Success Principles mm -hmm. by Jack Canfield. And he's just a success coach. You know, he gives lectures to Fortune 100 companies and, and has tons of books. And his uh, his structure in The Success Principles is what I really closely followed for San Francisco. There's another book that I really like called The Ultimate Guide to Mental Toughness mm -hmm. by Daniel Teitelbaum. Okay. Similar book. And there were a lot of great things about programming your subconscious in that book. The main thing that I got from that is to use the metaphor of your mind being like a guided missile mm -hmm. and how we can program our subconscious like a missile and send it in a direction. And we have full control over that. And it, once we get our subconscious mind programmed, our mind will take care of filtering out what's going to help us go in that direction and what's not. And okay. it'll create events, circumstances, thought patterns that will push you in that direction. But you have to be very diligent on programming it. So that's a really good mm. resource as well. Okay. And then I love the book, Your Body is Your Subconscious Mind by Louise Hay. And that's a much more, uh, she was a psychologist. So that has to do much more with the psychology of the subconscious, the biological effects that your subconscious has and how to kind of integrate those two things. Those are like my top three. Nice, okay, we'll put uh, we'll put those in the comments for sure later on. Uh, I'll definitely type them. Diana, flute players of the bomb, yes, they are. I think she was talking about playing for other people. Flute players of the bomb. Yeah, uh, Dustin Hagler. Hi Bryce, it's been a while. I remember when you shifted your audition approach at BU playing for non-percussionists as much as you mentioned, but how much did you focus on matching a regional sound as opposed to investing more time on your own sound concept that doesn't necessarily match the group you're auditioning for and hoping the committee will accept your difference. And then a follow-up to that, yeah. should the committee hear the orchestra sound or your ideal orchestra sound? It's a big Ooh, one. Ooh, that's a tough question. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. I'll start with the first one. You know, okay. like I said, Tim Jenis pushed me off in the direction of, of finding my own sound. So I was never really concerned with a regional sound. Like we had talked about, I'd never been dogmatic in that way. Um, 
when he gave me that advice and sent me off in that direction, to me, it was all about my own individual sound. Uh, by synthesizing everything my mentors had taught me, trying those different things, playing for people, that's how I came up with my individual sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, and so I wasn't worried about that. I, I also had been given advice not to worry about the sound of the orchestra you're auditioning for um, in general. There are some orchestras maybe that have like such a tried and true sound, but I don't think that really applies to percussion. I feel like, you know, the woodwind section in the Cleveland orchestra has a very distinct sound. And if yeah. I was a woodwind player auditioning for Cleveland, I maybe would consider doing that. But percussion, I think uh, there's just not that in my opinion as mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. as much. Okay. So I never really worried about that. Awesome. Um, that's a great question about hearing the sound of the orchestra. I think my answer to that is going to be, I want them to hear what they think the orchestra says, should sound like. And my reason for that is because that means that they're the most at ease. You know, I always wanted my audience first and foremost to be at ease, never mm -hmm. to be nervous or confused or question anything that I was doing, yes. but to kind of, you know, view this as a holistic experience. I consider auditions like uh, presentations, like job pitches, like I'm selling something, I'm selling a product. And so I want them to take the information I'm giving them and run with it and create their own picture around what I'm giving them. And hopefully they like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely hear their version of the orchestra while I'm playing. Okay, their version. Wow, okay, good answer. Uh, I think this is a follow-up to Brandon Shant's question earlier. I fear we've come to a point at this level that there could be a double major, how to play in an ensemble and how to take an audition. Where is the connection? There is a double standard, and I don't want to say, sorry, I don't want to say double standard. Taking the audition and playing with the ensemble are two very distinct skill sets. Yes. And I embodied that very early on, and knew that I was going to have to kind of go down that path. So that's why I talked about that two year period where I took 14 auditions. So that's more than one every other month. Mm -hmm. And that period for me was learning the art and skill of taking auditions. And by the time I got to Billings, Montreal and San Francisco, I had proctors coming up to me and telling me that they couldn't believe how relaxed my energy was in the audition that they had been nice. with candidates all day long. And I was like, just super at ease. And they felt the need to share that with me mm -hmm. because it was so different for them. Uh, and so that I did that, right. I took 14 auditions in that period. And by the, you know, numbers 12, 13 and 14, I had felt comfortable with what I thought the skill of taking an audition was mm -hmm. to combat the ensemble side of that. When I was, uh, I showed up in Boston as a freshman, I knew that they were two separate things. So I started playing with tons of community orchestras. I went uh, my first two years of undergrad playing in like three ensembles regularly. So I was going to tons of rehearsals every week for a while. That was confusing for a while. I was like, should mm -hmm. I be doing this? Maybe I should be practicing mm -hmm. more because rehearsals take a lot of time, you know, three mm -hmm. hours and then you got to travel, whatever. Um, but I started playing with ensembles as early as I could. And my freshman and sophomore years, I just did every free community orchestra I could get in with pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. to an extent. Some of them I would play with and I didn't feel like I was gaining ensemble skills. And so I maybe wouldn't do that one again. But I was constantly mm -hmm. seeking out ensembles to play with. Then from my junior year forward, I wanted to get paid, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to become known as the guy that will do anything for free or everything for free. So I started trying to get paid work, but I was still constantly playing with ensembles outside of school. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure so many people do that. A lot of people kind of stick to their school ensembles, right, right. but I was always out playing with different ensembles. So by the time I started subbing with professional orchestras, by the time I won Billings and got ready to, to play with more major symphonies, I felt like I had the ensemble skills because I've been doing it for so long, going to summer festivals, playing year round, all year long with as many ensembles as possible for seven years mm -hmm. kind of helped me like I built the skill of playing in ensembles yeah. outside so, of audition. Yeah. So, and, and also in your audition, you did have to do ensemble playing like in the end of the final right. round and in the orchestra week. So, you know, committees are aware that they're two different skill sets. Unfortunately, the audition process is just the, the only way we really know how to hire someone, but committees also know that you need to test someone in the ensemble. So I think that's just the Brandon, I think that's just the evolution of auditions now you just have to have both skills and they are two very different skills. Auditioning is certainly its own sport for sure. Uh, okay. Gregory I just Hicks. Want to one last thing. On oh, that. sure. Sure. Um, I'm not saying that auditions are perfect. 
I don't think they're the perfect way to hire people. Like you just said, Eddie, that's the way that we know. So I'm not trying to say that it's the best way to hire an orchestral musician, right. but it is the requisite way to get a job. And yeah. that's my mentality that I established early on. I was going to do whatever I had to do to get that job. And so I was going to figure out what taking auditions was like and how to build those skills and then do the ensemble part as well. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Gregory Hicks, I think this is regarding when the Greg. symphony, when the, uh, Season's going to start, fingers crossed, September 30th. Yeah, I hope so. That would be that'd be great. Uh, Brandon, Brandon Greg Schultz. Greg is a good friend and colleague. Oh, okay. Awesome. What does Greg he play? Greg is uh, the artist liaison for the San oh. Francisco Symphony. Awesome. Welcome, Greg. Thanks so he's for down there working every day. Thank you so much, Greg, for everything you're doing, helping the orchestra get ready for next season and doing all the groundwork for when we're ready to get back going again. So fingers awesome. crossed, September 30th. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Brandon Schultz. The season will start when Ed Steffen says it will start. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's, uh, <laughs> that's also it. yeah. That's also true. They will consult Ed first. Also true. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Andres Pichardo. Hell yeah, Bryce, dude. Andres, good to hear you. Uh, good to hear from you. Uh, let's see what else Andres we got. Yeah, see. I think that is pretty much all the questions. Naoko Takata, this is great to hear. Thank you. Uh, and Brandon had a few more things. I guess just really quick. Doesn't this just overcomplicate the audition process? We're talking music here: feeling, time, sound, timbre. There's a lot of chance and luck. Why can't we admit it? No, I mean, I think we admitted all those things. It's just it's just kind of a new evolution. It's not the way it used to be. Um, are we going to tap into advanced level biological and physical sciences to justify practice protocols in music? Uh, yeah, I guess. Brand, he says, sorry, I love, I love this guy and work ethic, just passionate about the topic. No, I get it. Brandon's a good friend. He was our guest last week. Uh, he always has a lot of very good in-depth questions, but... Um, yeah, honestly, I think I, this is just the evolution. Yeah, if you want to address that really quickly, go ahead. All I'm saying is what worked for me. You know, this mm -hmm. is what spoke to my personality type, what my interests were, what kind of helped me click. So am I saying that everyone has to go study neuroscience and quantum physics and epigenetics? Not at all. But this is, for me personally and the person that I am, mm -hmm. what put me on that trajectory to go from – you know, the Billing Symphony, the San Francisco Symphony, which is kind of why I got on to chat today. So I'm just right. sharing my personal experience. I think it can apply to a lot of people. These are scientific things that happen if you want to explore and, uh, you know, try and figure those things out. I think it applies to everyone, but it did speak to me personally. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and, and obviously you don't, I mean, you don't have to study it as much as Bryce did. You can take these principles away, like, uh, you know, being organized, doing the the visualizations writing down the brain map doing all those these exercises that can just help you see your goal and and move towards it you don't have to read like do all this intensely he's done it for us and he's told us about it so maybe just right. take take the things he said and maybe try and apply it we have all sorts of time it's a good time to experiment with your approach right now but bryce Definitely. thank you so much for being here man that was chock full of information i know you were speaking a mile a minute, and I feel like we could probably talk for another hour about this, but I'm glad we got Definitely. in what we did. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'll catch up with you in a second, okay? Absolutely. Oh, actually, Thank quickly, you any, so anything, much for watching. anything you want to plug really quick? Anything you got coming up or... Yeah, I mean, I'm available to do, you know, to chat with people individually. If anyone has more questions or things they want to run by me, please mm -hmm. let me know. I'll comment on this uh, thread once we're off with my email address. That's the best way to get a hold of me. And I would love to keep this conversation going and talk about how people might be able to incorporate these things individually. I saw Eddie did a great job advertising his online lessons. I'm also doing online lessons. I know there's a ton of us doing them right now, yeah. but if anyone wants to do any kind of, you know, audition prep, mock auditions, percussionists want to talk about anything that I talked about that I was doing tactilely on these instruments and skills that I felt like I developed, I'm happy to share those in a lesson setting. And, um, I have one more thought for Brandon because he's just so thought provoking. Okay. Um, you know, my goal for this, Brandon, was to try and have as integrated an experience in the audition as possible. And uh, I think this is what's talked about a lot in Alexander Technique. So there are people in the music world talking about these kinds of things. For me, I went a more scientific route of integrating my mind with my body. But there are practices like Alexander Technique specifically for musicians that are kind of going at the same thing. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be as scientific as I was saying. Right. Well, it's, I think it's a great approach and obviously it brought you success and it was amazing. So thank you again for being here. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Bryce. Eddie, thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for watching. I really enjoyed it. Of course. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode eight. That is a wrap. That was a long one. My longest episode yet. Usually try and keep it an hour, but it was just very interesting. I hope you all found it equally interesting. 
I think the main takeaway uh, besides preparation is thoughts become beliefs, become reality, like really embody that. And I hope you take some of these principles that Bryce was talking about and incorporate them into your practice strategy. I think this is kind of the new way to approach auditions to be a whole musician, a musical player, and also just a technical badass. So you can combine all those things. You're probably going to win an audition. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Next week, I am going to have the third flute slash piccolo player of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Erica Peel. Uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about yet, but she is a good friend of mine and my and my wife's, and I am so looking forward to catching up with her and, and also her unconventional way of winning one of the biggest positions in one of the biggest orchestras in the world. So I hope you tune in next Friday, 5 p.m. Uh, Western, 8 p.m. Eastern. And until then, bye for now. <laughs>